Welcome to Geared Up, brought to you by National Car Rental. I'm Todd Bishop. I'm Andrew Edwards. Thanks for listening, everybody. We've got a big show coming up, including a discussion of the secret formula behind the Amazon's choice label. Which you uncovered. Finally being revealed by Amazon. We found it, and uh, we're going to talk to you about it later on in the show. Plus, some surprising stats about Apple's HomePod, mm -hmm. which depending on how you define it, is either an Amazon Echo competitor or not. Right, yeah, I think, and that's, I think that's part of the problem. We can debate that, plus a new subscription service from Apple News. And if we have time, we're going to talk about the Xbox One and the status of the backward compatibility program. Right, well, now that we've said it, we have to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So. Hey, before we jump in, though, Andrew, I've got a surprise. Okay. Look what I finally bought. Whoa! I finally Whoa. got my AirPods. I know this has been a long-time <laughs> campaign on your part. Yes, man. <laughs> So okay. I love them. I, they have totally changed. In fact, I'm going to wear them the entire show. <laughs> they have totally changed how I listen to music, the frequency of right. my listening, just the entire situation. I love them. I have not lost them yet, but I will tell you. You're never going to. The ultimatum for my wife was, if you lose them, you are not buying another pair. Did, did, you, think agree, that's did fair? you agree to that? I agreed to that. You agreed to it. What? Well, See, all you second, had to do was not second. agree. Wait, I... I don't know that there's any agreeing or disagreeing with an ultimatum from your spouse. All I'm saying is if she just says <laughs> it and you don't say anything back, then technically you have not agreed to the ultimatum. I, I will say that the, I, I just I, for all the reasons that you love the AirPods, yes. I love them. I, have I, wish that, I wish I'd got them, gotten them sooner. Right so. here. I always keep them in the, in the little jeans pocket because they fit in that little pocket okay. that you never use ever. That's the AirPods pocket. You know why I got them? I was on vacation in Phoenix, and the resort where we were staying had a basketball court. I love to shoot hoops, just on my own. Did not know this. My, my knees are not good enough for actual one-on-one. Can, -on -one. Can you dunk? Not anymore. Um, you used to? I, I've never dunked in my life. It, it, maybe on like a nine and a half foot <laughs> rim, there was a point when I was maybe 16 and a half years old that yes, I okay. could dunk. I would not call myself, I, I've got a great baseline shot. I got a great baseline jumper, but Fair. long ago my knees gave out on me. I had uh, ACL, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I love to shoot. And so the problem is you don't want to wear your iPhone X in your, your iPhone 10 in your pocket no. while you're shooting hoops. No. So I was like, I finally got to get the AirPods. So I went and I got my AirPods while I was on vacation and Changed the whole experience. I told you. Shooting hoops. I see people focus on the sound quality, which they're not the best sound quality yeah, in the world, great. but they sound fine. But the con there's no better convenience factor than what Apple's done with the AirPods. That's right. So that's just it. You open them up, they're connected, you put them in, you listen. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's but not even part of the show. Once again, a big thanks to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. Let's jump in with the first piece of news. What's the, what's the first story? Andrew, how often do you shop on Amazon? <laughs> um, at a min I would say at a minimum every other day. So do you ever notice or even look for the little label that says Amazon's choice among the various products in a certain category I don't, that you're looking I for? I don't look for it, but I've definitely seen it. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, sometimes it's like, hey, this is great. And sometimes it's like, that's, that may be your choice, but that's not what I'm looking for. Exactly, okay. Well, for me, someone who's less informed, and I think mm -hmm. for the rest of the population, yeah. I'm like a, an actual product reviewer <laughs> that I have sitting next to me, I actually look to it quite a bit. Really? And it influences my buying decisions. Okay. And the thing about Amazon's choice, though, was previously, Amazon would not tell you why it was choosing a particular product as its choice. It was actually a big mystery. They told you generally that in products with low return rates and fast shipping. Those are two of the criteria they used. But on an individual product, and not in any detail, did they give you any kind of indication about why they were choosing it. Okay, so let's back up a second. So Amazon's choice is you search for a product, they give you search results, and one of them is Amazon's choice? Yeah, it's that basically correct? Amazon giving its blessing to a particular product and saying, hey... Based on a search, though. Based on, well, no, if you go to the product page as well, it has it right there. It says, this is Amazon's choice. So okay. it's basically like a, a confidence builder. Like, okay. we think that if you buy this product, you'll like it. That's the mm -hmm. implication, okay. at least. Fair so enough. in the past, though, you had no idea why yeah. they were doing it. Now, just over the past week, they have started revealing very specific information about why they choose the products they choose. Okay. For example, an Acer Predator gaming laptop. Okay. The reason that is an Amazon's choice is that it has, one, a low return rate, 28% fewer returns than similar products. Two, it's highly rated, 4.1 stars with over 1,100 reviews. And three, it's a popular item. 
popular with customers searching for, quote, gaming laptop. Okay. So those are just a few of the criteria. What's interesting here to me is your line of work could be in jeopardy. What if the algorithms collectively become smarter than the individual product reviewers reviewing a product? Not happening. <laughs> not happening. I'll tell you why. I mean, first of all, this sounds like, not that this is a negative thing, but it sounds like it's helping you in a way, but it's also very helpful to Amazon to sell things that are not going to get returned to them because they don't have to deal with two-way shipping, they don't have to deal with restocking, they don't have to deal with, you've already opened it, now we're selling it as a refurb or whatever. So it's help, it's helping you in a way, but it's also self-serving in a way. Absolutely. Right? Um, when you base it on reviews, we've, we've heard the problem, a lot of these reviews get gamed. A lot, of, a lot of companies will pay people to either just put in positive reviews or they'll send out free product in, with the understanding that, hey, Review it in your own voice, but if you want to get more, it better be a good one. So there's there's a couple, some of those, some of these, and I don't know if there's other signals that they use and that they the, 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 There are four main ones that we were able to find. And by the way, GeekWire broke this story. We were able to break it, and then CNET and you, others sir, followed us. found this. Yeah, so it's a small thing, but it has been a big mystery that a lot of people have covered because it's kind of part of the secret sauce. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and it's part of the e-commerce landscape. But to your point, the other criteria, one of the other criteria, is whether it's eligible for free prime shipping, which obviously also plays into Amazon's business interest. Yes. You could say it's also in the interest of the consumer, the it person is. buying it, if he or she is a prime member. Yes. But in that instance, that does not inform the quality of the product at all. It just no. How fast I can have it delivered. Right. It, so. But that then does make it one of Amazon's choices. I yes. Mean, True. So that, that is interesting. To me, mm. what's interesting is all of it is quantifiable in one way or another. So right. it's taking the qualitative nature out of the reviews, basically saying an algorithm, a formula, can determine whether this product is something that you're going to like. Right. I would be really curious to hear what people out there think. People in Geared Up yeah. Nation, when you go... The Geared with, Up Nation, <laughs> we have a question for you. When you go with an Amazon Choice product, and when you've done that in the past... Is it something that's actually been something you've liked? For that's me, interesting. For me, the answer has been yes. I've heard people say no, that for them, they really, uh, they, they like to do a deep dive into the, the, the reviews, the comments. Sure. I am more of someone who, I want what I want rather than what will just accomplish the task, I guess. So if I'm looking for a gaming laptop, for example, and they recommend that one, I know that while that may be suitable for me, I really want something with, let's just say, 32 gigs of RAM, right? Or with this specific graphics card because I want to use it for VR or something like that, rather than, you know, here's 10 that would do the job, but here's the one that we think you won't return. Yeah. That's not, that's not good enough for me. At least when it comes to tech. And I will say that I still give much higher value to word of mouth. I'll give you an example. You connected us with a great live streaming guru, David Foster. David Geek's Foster. Life. Shout out to David Foster at Geek's Life. So he recommended a high-end mm -hmm. computer for us. We've got it sitting right over there awaiting the arrival of our... Uh, the fiber, fiber connection. The fiber yes. connection. If you're waiting for the live streams to return, they are coming back. We did not stop those. We're just waiting for the fiber to arrive in yes. his office. So I basically bought exactly what he told me to buy. Mm -hmm. and it was basically David Foster's choice. Right. <laughs> so I, to me, I value that what a friend or actually an expert yeah. would tell me more than I would Amazon's choice. Yes. But you know what? Like Now that I'm thinking about it, when it comes to tech, I know what I want. But if I was searching for clothes, I don't know. Cl I know clothes. what I want when it comes to clothes. <laughs> But if I'm searching for, I don't know, linen or like <laughs> kitchen stuff. How about a new car? No, that would qualify as tech <laughs> as well. That's correct. But, you know, household stuff, yeah. I probably would. New flooring? New flo Oh, God, don't, <laughs> don't get me started. I'm in the middle. If you're watching my Instagram, I'm in the middle of new flooring hell right now. All right. Um, so that is, that's the secret formula that's cool. revealed. That it's is cool. Like it's kind of like it's right up there with the, the KFC original <laughs> recipe. It's right, Amazon's right. secret formula. I want for you to... <laughs> Every at least once a month, reveal something new about Amazon's how they work internally. Formula. Yes, I, I would do my I'm best. I do that once a month. That's not enough. Is that? <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so that is story number one. Yes. Amazon's choice formula revealed. Story number two, Apple's HomePod. Yes. Remind us. I love Andrew. the HomePod. You, so you've got it? I have a couple. For two. I have two. For people who don't know what the HomePod is, mm -hmm. remind us. All right, so Apple's HomePod is Apple's, uh, basically, the easiest way to describe it is it's their Apple Music speaker. So it's a, a standalone speaker. It's about as tall as a soda can. It's actually not that big, but it really? is. Really? Yeah, it it's looks not in that the pictures large. Like it's way bigger. I know. It fits. It fits in the palm of your hand. It's about as tall as a soda can, but it is fairly thick. Three hundred and fifty dollars. Um, Three hundred fifty bucks. It works with Siri, so you can talk to it to request things. Um, the Siri functionality is fairly basic in that it can do home automation stuff. It can obviously it's it's optimized for Apple Music, um, and it can answer you know. The trivia of how how big is a blue whale or whatever it is you want to ask it. But it's certainly not on the level of the sophistication. Correct. Of the Echo or Alexa or even Google Assistant. Yep. Cortana. <laughs> it's really? probably really? Cortana's Cortana's really good, just no one uses it. Cortana's really good. Um, no, so the problem here is the home pod is not selling as well as probably Apple would like. Um, and the report from Bloomberg, Mark uh, Gurman, Mark Gurman the, the weekly Mark Gurman Yes, scoop. he says that some Apple stores are actually selling single digits per day. So not even selling 10 HomePods hmm. per day, which is actually, in the grand scheme of things, for an Apple store, that's a very small amount because hmm. Apple stores are very high traffic. They are the best-selling retail per square foot in the world. Um, and the HomePod is a new product. So anything new, like they're probably selling 10 iPods a day. When's the last time Apple updated the iPod? Right. Like those are fairly old. So, you know, it's it's interesting because the HomePod as a product, Apple started manufacturing, or not manufacturing, they started planning it five years ago. Before the original Echo, I believe, was even released five years ago. And their idea was that they were gonna make the best music speaker that they could make. And they did. It sounds phenomenal. It's a fantastic speaker. Um, if you compare it to other speakers in the same price, it sounds better than yep. those speakers. If I understand correctly, it adapts to the shape of your room. Not only that, yes. Though so if you pick it up, there's a, there is a gyroscope inside. So if you pick it up, it knows it's been moved. It will re-scan the room. It knows where it is in the room. It knows if you have another HomePod in the room, they both know where they are in the room and where they are in relation to each other. And it'll optimize the bass, the treble, the mids, the highs, the lows, everything based on where it's been placed and what's around it. Is there a where's the corner, where's the flat surfaces, everything. The problem, I think, is that despite it being a better speaker than, let's just say, the $400 Google Home Max, as it pertains to playing music, it's nowhere near as good at answering questions or requests. And the dilemma here, I guess, or what Apple didn't plan for, is that people aren't looking to spend money on sound so much as they're looking to spend money on functionality. And utility. I really think that this is another classic example of Apple being Apple, where they've got a great idea, they're singularly focused mm -hmm. on bringing this to market as a speaker, as a high-end music speaker. Right. And if you look at the way the Mac rolled out, I mean, it was designed initially largely to appeal to people who with a, a flair for graphic design and, and doing you know, initial layout. Yeah. And I think that this is very similar. I think there's a good chance that Apple with the HomePod could end up with 5% of the market, at, just like they have of the, the personal computer That's market. That's crazy. I mean, well, here, I mean. Because, I mean, there, the market for, the market of people, the number of people who want that high-end audio experience right. is naturally smaller Correct. than the people who want basic functionality. And, I, I really think that it, the, the analogy is very similar to well, the PC market. Here's the thing. So, the personal computer market, not the Windows yes. PC market. Apple is number two in the home audio streaming market. Spotify's number one, mm -hmm. and Apple's number two. Apple has 40 million paying customers now. I believe Spotify has around 75 or 80 million. So in, in about two and a half years, Apple's got to half of the market share of Spotify. 40 million people don't have a speaker that will play Apple Music because none of the others, like Sonos or Google Home Max or any of them, none of them can you ask with your voice 
to control Apple Music. You can control it through an app, my Bluetooth thing, or you know, mm -hmm. Sonos through the Sonos app. But there's nothing but the HomePod that will let you just speak your command. But again, it seems like Apple was too narrow focused because and too expensive. And to, so, and that's the thing. So, the expense is expensive. Three fifty is expensive, but compared to other speakers' sound quality, it's not because it's in the same it's in the same ballpark, but sounds better than even more expensive speakers. It's the fact that it's not respond. I don't even know what you, what you call it. It's not. I don't even know what people are expecting it to do, quite honestly, because if I ask it to lock my front door, it'll lock my front door. If I ask it to raise or lower the blinds, it'll do that. Change the temperature in my home, it'll do that. What is it that it's not doing? Well, so are there things that you can do on an Echo that you can't do? Yes. For there's example, plenty of... Like what? So this goes back to the developer stuff, though, right. because Amazon's Alexa platform is so open that anyone can tie anything to it. And that's probably what it is. There right. are things you can ask Alexa to do with your devices that yep. the HomePod can't just because it doesn't connect to HomeKit. It does not connect to HomeKit. The devices. The, the HomePod does. There are more devices that support Alexa than there are that support HomeKit. Right. So therefore, your $50 or $30 Amazon Echo Dot can, can, can do more in your home than your $350 HomePod. Here's my favorite latest Alexa example. Have you heard of the show Chompers? I have not heard of the show <laughs> Chompers. <laughs> so Chompers is a daily toothbrushing show. What? Where you can play it either as a podcast or on your Alexa. <laughs> and it's entertainment for your kids that guides them through the recommended two minutes serious? of brushing every day. It is magic. This I recommend fantastic. it to everybody. It's wonderfully produced. It's put out by Gimlet, the company that's... Uh, does startup and other things. You listen to it while you brush your teeth, though. You, you? you and your kids. You, no, yeah, you, you too, do. though. I, well, when my daughter's brushing her teeth, <laughs> I, do, I, do, I do that, too. But it's great. But the thing is, on Alexa, it keeps score for you. So it knows when you've come back and how many days you've come okay. back to do your recommended two minutes of brushing. So to me, like that's what I want in a and smart speaker. And all you need is a $30 Echo Dot exactly. to get that experience, I, right? Right. We happen to use the... The Echo Show. You can use more if you want to, but but thirty dollars at discount. I mean, right. It's what it's not. That's not the. I think the it's fifty bucks. Price. Yeah. Right. Fifty bucks. But still, what I'm saying is, you can get that function, that basic functionality, if you want to, by paying fifty dollars. Okay. And with Apple, you have to pay three fifty. Bottom line on this HomePod story, Mark Gurman from Bloomberg Technology is reporting that during the HomePod's first ten weeks of sales, mm -hmm. it was just ten percent of the smart speaker market. Amazon Echo, don't look, had how, how much do you guess? How much do you guess the Echo had during that same period? Um, I'm going to say Google had Google had to have some of that as well. Yep. So I'm going to give Google 5% Ooh, wow. because it wasn't launching something new. Really? Wow, you, you're you a hater. No, I'm just... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm you're way off. Let me tell you you're really? Because I was going to say okay, that so Amazon... Google, Google had more than Apple. Okay. So Not much more. I'll give Google uh, 15%. Yep, 14, close enough. Okay. So then what's, 10, what's 15, left? 80? So they, uh, Amazon had seventy three. Okay. Yeah. So and that that's that's a Windows, Mac. And that is at launch. At launch, exactly. That's, that's not good. Yeah. That's not good. All right. So that's the home pod. We will link to that story from the show notes. Yes. From the Geared Up podcast. On the rumor though is Apple will be releasing a cheaper home pod in the future. Okay. Which is not a game Apple typically plays. I still think they just got to boost the third-party ecosystem, which is that another is what they need to another do. Uh, playback to the the Windows days because Correct. that was the Correct. virtuous cycle that Microsoft spun up that made Windows not come on back Tim. In the day. All right, all right, we will be right back on Geared Up talking about more Apple news. In fact, Apple news Apple will news. be the topic coming up. That's next. Welcome back to Geared Up. It is time for the National Car Rental Story of the Week. Yes, big shout out to National Car Rental for sponsoring Geared Up. Go National. Go like a pro. I also do a show called Technically Speaking for National Car Rental as well. You visited me on the set last time. It was fun. A lot of fun. And you can find that at nationalcar.com at the Control Center, also at youtube.com slash nationalcarrent. This is where Andrew gives you all the inside tips and tricks for travelers. Yeah, so if you're traveling, whether it's business travel or personal travel, I basically break down all the best tech that you should take with you on your travels to make life a little bit easier. Awesome. So you can find that show. And 
This is the National Car Rental Story of the Week. Yes, let's get into it. What so, is the story? So Apple is coming out, rumors say. Yes. The rumors are always talking. That's you know? right. I mean, especially when it's Apple, there's a lot of rumors. With its own subscription news service, right. which ties into a story we had a few weeks ago. Yes, we talked about this. About an acquisition that Apple made. Right. Tell us about this story. Apple okay. acquired a company called Texture, which was an app that allowed you to pay, I believe it was $10 a month, and you got to read an unlimited number of magazines. And it's the magazines you'd find in any grocery store or anything like that. So Wired Magazine or Good Housekeeping. Really, I don't know why I picked those two, but any magazine in the U.S. that you could think of was pretty much a part of this. Because you're redoing your floors. That's right, why. Good Housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> so, texture, $10 a month, read all the magazines you want. So it's basically the Netflix of magazines. Apple bought this company, and apparently about 20 people were laid off, but the rest of the team was integrated into the Apple News team. And Apple News, if you don't know, is an app on the uh, iPad and iPhone that ships as part of iOS where you can read you know, the news that interests you. And it's kind of like Apple Music in a way where as you read your news, you can hit the like button on stories that you like and dislike, and it'll start to kind of tailor the news to you, um, pulling from all different you know, websites and newspapers to kind of make your own personalized magazine or newspaper for the news. So that's what Apple News does today, and the rumor is that in the next version of iOS, they'll be announcing, as part of that, a $10 per month subscription, all-you-can-eat news service. And so the idea would be to leverage that Texture magazine portfolio. Mm -hmm. So basically, they're adapting Texture to the Apple News Right, app right. And, and putting it in there. Yes, but what we don't know, so there's some questions here, because Apple News as it stands isn't, there's no magazines in there unless the magazines have a web version. So it would have the magazines, but what about things like the New York Times or the Post where you have to pay them anyway? If you want to read the New York Times online, you have to have a subscription. Um, will that $10 per month cover everything and then will Apple keep a portion and then dole it out to the publishers based on how many articles get yeah. read, or you know, how how does that work? Because it's similar to the music industry. You pay Apple Music ten bucks a month, or Spotify, or whoever, and on the back end, they keep a portion of it, but then they have to figure out how many times this song was played and what that means as far as your nine ninety nine and how that all gets doled out. Are they going to try to save save the publishing industry through this? And this is something that Apple's tried before. They had an app called Newsstand, I believe, in the past yes, they that did. did something similar. So this would not be a first attempt by Apple. The thing that I like about the Apple News app on the iPhone in particular is I get at least a sampling of stuff that I would mm -hmm. otherwise have to pay for. Now, in my case, I happen to also pay for subscriptions to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and all these other things right. through, through work. So I have access to that material, but I still find myself going to the Apple News app because I get a breadth of content. Mm -hmm not just from one particular publisher. And then it's basically like my front door to right. the subscription content that I also subscribe to. Do you to. find that Apple News tailors itself to you? It feels like it, for sure. Yeah. So that, I assume, makes it more, you know, you'd rather go to something that's for you than just opening the New York Times app and just seeing whatever the deluge of the day is, right? Absolutely, there's something to be said for personalization. Also, this is an interesting example of the freemium model if they go this route, where you would have the news that would be sort of the commodity that would bring you in for free, and then you'd say, oh, I really want to go deep on this particular subject, so I'm going to subscribe to the right. $10 a month and have uh, access to, to all these different things. Uh, Apple and Amazon are somewhat competitors in this realm. You've got these two content subscriptions, you know, App Amazon with some of their Kindle programs that you get oh, through right. the prime, prime reading. I mean, it's, it's interesting. One of, the th one of the fascinating things that came out of the Facebook hearings for me was just all of the different businesses that Facebook is in. And then here you look at this. It's another example. I mean, Apple is known as the iPhone and iPad right. and, and Mac maker and uh, maybe the HomePod maker. And, and <laughs> maybe, eventually. <laughs> Apple TV and all that stuff. But here you have a good example where their services business is actually becoming Absolutely. a big part of the company. Right. I'm curious, though, how many people want to pay for news? How many people want to pay for news? I think the answer to that question has changed for a couple reasons over the last two years. Two years, really? Yes, a okay. year, year or two years. I, I think, first off, I think with the deluge of information on Twitter 
and Facebook and social media, there has come to be a new appreciation for single dedicated sources of mm. news. Now, I, I don't think this is the, the majority of readers, but I think there's an increase in the number of people who appreciate curated single sources of news and high quality news like you would get from something you would pay for. Right. I, I also think that uh, with just essentially the, the deluge of fake news and all that stuff, I think it's, it's something that, that people have, have started to pay for. And I think there is a certain altruistic bent among news subscribers where they feel like this is one way to support democracy, mm. to pay for something that, yes, you could get it for free, you could use your incognito window right. and you could get it for free, but from a practical and altruistic standpoint, it's, it's just better to, to actually support it, almost like a public radio model. Okay. That's, that's my take. No, that's I don't think it's the majority of the audience, but I think it's, right. it's, it's greater now than it was a couple years ago. That does make sense. There's, but there's also the whole thing of everything is 10 bucks a month now. Yeah, right. That's true. Your Apple Music or Netflix. your Spotify, your Netflix, your Hulu, like everything is 10 bucks a month. Like there was a day in the past where yeah. you would pay 100 bucks a month for cable and you were like, I wish I could just pay for what I want. Pay right. for ESPN, which is another right, thing right. that, you that go, you're paying for. Bucks a month yeah, now. exactly. So, so now you can cut the cord, but you have to pay for your internet. And then you have to pay your ten bucks for Netflix, ten bucks for Hulu, ten bucks for music, ten bucks for news, eight bucks for ESPN. And all of a sudden, you're saying to yourself, "I wish I didn't have all these services. I wish there was one service that would just have it all <laughs> for a hundred bucks a month, which would be the old school cable." I don't know that you know people. It seems people really are way more willing to pay for entertainment than for news, than for, like to escape than to stay in reality. I don't know. We'll see. But it's at least interesting to see Apple trying to be, I think it's exactly what you said. Apple is trying to be this, you know, we're all about privacy. We're all about like upholding these values. And I think news is one of those things that they've tried and failed in the past yeah. with the new stand app that they want to keep, you know, available and make valuable to, to the owners of iOS devices, which we've seen people who own iOS devices are more likely to buy apps and buy subscriptions than Android counterparts. Yeah. All right. So that is the rumor, at least, that mm -hmm. Apple is planning to come out with its own subscription news service as part of the Apple News app leveraging the, mm -hmm. the texture app acquisition, the right, magazine right. subscription service. So likely it will be 10 bucks a month, but none of probably. this is confirmed. Yeah, yeah, but well, if it happens, we'll probably see it at WWDC When's as that part of out? iOS June? 12. Um, WWDC is usually in August. August, okay, yeah. all right. Good deal, so that is the National Car Rental Story of the Week. Let's move on to our final story of the week. All right. The Xbox. Xbox, one of my favorite, one of my favorite consoles out there. So, do you know the most popular story ever written on GeekWire, Andrew? Pop quiz. How what, old is GeekWire? What would the topic be? It, it is, the GeekWire is seven years old. We were founded in March of 2011. Okay, so in the past seven years. Yes, the most popular story. And I will say that there is a reason I'm bringing it up in this segment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not a total non sequitur. All right, well then it must be something related to Xbox. Yes. I was going to say something about Amazon. It's like some crazy yes. Amazon or Microsoft no. story. No, it is. Yes, you can. How to play Xbox 360 games on your Xbox One. What? That's the, that is the, what is that? The most, most popular read? story ever. Most popular means most read. Most read, yes. Really? And it, and it still what? shows up in the top. In fact, it's a running joke around the office. <laughs> the reason it was the Who most popular, it, Taylor Soper, I mm. have to take credit for the headline. <laughs> credit or blame. Okay. This was back when it was not yet possible to get backwards compatible games on the Xbox One. This was on the Xbox One launch. It was probably one of the stories that I regret most Wait about GeekWire because the answer to the question of how to play games, Xbox 360 games on your Xbox One at the time yeah. was to take an HDMI cord and plug it from your Xbox 360 no, you <laughs> into your not. Xbox One. We did. Well, Microsoft <laughs> was actually talking about this at the time as an actual solution for people. That's hilarious. <laughs> so Wait, they recommended this? They, oh, when God. we asked them, hey, what about backward compatibility? I don't know if they were pulling our leg or what, but you actually could just take an HDMI right. cord from the 360 to the one, and you were good. And so That's like, we were thought, well, we actually, we were not trying to do clickbait. Mm -hmm. We kind of naively did. But 
in hindsight, it was probably not. No, a good no, thing. it's fine. At any rate, three years ago, as you know, Andrew, Microsoft actually came out with true yes. backward compatibility, where you could take games mm -hmm. from your Xbox 360 and late, then later from your original Xbox. Yes, and that's just recently. Ago. Yeah. Um, but when they announced three years ago um, the Xbox 360 portion, the people on the PlayStation side laughed at them. Yes. Saying your 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 way to attack us is to play old games, Exactly. we're giving you new games, and you're trying to play old games, and, and I thought it would backfire. And I still think that is a reasonable knock on the mm -hmm. Xbox One, if you look at exclusive titles. Yes, absolutely. That is something that the Xbox One does not do as well absolutely. as some of the others, but backward compatibility has in some ways saved them. Reinvigorated their business. Well, you know, it's interesting because none of the other current generation consoles, PlayStation 4 or Nintendo Switch, allow you to play your back catalog of games. And some people will say, well, who cares? Because you want to play all the new stuff. But they're not ashamed to put old titles in the digital catalog and have you rebuy them right. on PlayStation, or especially Nintendo's notorious for this. They will release, you know, at some point for Nintendo Switch, they will release a digital download of, let's just say, Super Mario Bros. 3, which is 35 years old, and charge you $8 for it rather than, you know, seeing you already bought it on the Wii U three years ago and tying it to your account. So you the Nintendo will keep selling you the same game over and over. So Microsoft is saying, hey, there's a lot of great games in the past. Xbox 360's game catalog was one of the best in history. You can play these games, and you all you need is the disc, and if you put the disc in the console, we'll download a digital copy of the game, and you can play it. If you own a digital copy, we'll just make it available to download. And it's smart because it, it makes you feel like there's value. And it also, to me, says whenever the next Xbox comes out, whatever it might be, it will be compatible with Xbox One games because now, they value that. Now, it's not every single Xbox 360 no. game. But the interesting thing is they've been rolling it out. And they do it via this emulation mm -hmm. technology where they're essentially creating an, uh, an environment that the game can run yes. in, even though it was originally written for the older console, but the whole idea is that they, they've done this over time. And the reason we're talking about it now is GeekWire and one of our contributors, Thomas Wilde, looked at this and said, okay, it's been three years, almost three years since they announced this, so where are they? And basically okay. they're up to 500 total titles, approximately, that wow. you can play on the Xbox One from older generations. Wow. They just announced the latest 19. Um, and it really is something, it's in many ways been the saving grace of the Xbox One. I mean, mm -hmm. you could argue that maybe the Xbox One X and the high dynamic range and all that right. stuff is, but that's pretty, that's kind of like the home pod. Yeah, of, yeah, that's of for the consoles. Yeah, that's for the techies. Like if, <laughs> yes. you're, if you're just an average person going to pick up an Xbox One today, you're going to get the S versus the X. Yes. Like the X is really for the hardcores, which is not the majority of the yeah. audience. But here's a good example, and obviously this person is biased, Phil Spencer, the head of oh, Xbox. Of course, okay. But this, I think this example is realistic. He was talking about Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption. Yes. Have you played that game? I have played that game. Good it's game. one of the best games of all time for yep. Xbox 360. So he started it on the Xbox 360. He still had his cloud save from 2011, so essentially oh, wow. saving his progress. He completed the middle section via backward compatibility on the Xbox One S over the summer, and then he completed the file, final story mission on, on 4K on the Xbox One X today. And so basically this backward compatibility enabled this really fascinating cross-generational right. gameplay. Thanks to the cloud save. And, th and the other thing is that you mentioned, which we should also like point out, they have been, when they release Xbox 360 and even original Xbox games, some of them are remastered for the Xbox One X. So you can play those older games that were available in 720p in 4K, in true 4K. So would you go out when something's released for backward compatibility and try and find it at a used game store? Me? Yeah. No. Would you what, recommend it? Um, I think what I would do, because it's not like they're... A used game store is always going to give you a, a, probably a, a better deal. But if it was me, I would just go and look. Because you can go into the digital store yeah. on the Xbox itself and see all the backwards compatible titles there. Um, and the cool thing is they make them readily available to download if you ever owned them in the past. Okay. So I can actually go in and it'll show like there's a, like it's like a notification badge. And it'll, if you look at ready to install, it'll be like there's 14 games ready to install. And you're like, what are these? And you tap on it. It's like there's 14 games that I used to own, you know, eight or ten years ago that I can just download right now and just play immediately. That's how, really cool. How much realistically, how much time would you spend playing old games? It depends on the game. So, for example, something like um, Halo 3 or something, which is 
a classic that you can still to this day enjoy, especially because as online gaming has gotten more and more popular, the last Halo, there's no way to play multiplayer on one TV. You have to play against someone on another Xbox, which was a huge uproar because right. one of the big things about Halo is you have three other friends and you're all split screen playing together. Um, it goes back to the original days of the LAN party, right? Right, I mean, that's, that is what Halo is. But you, now you can just download Halo 3. It's, um, graphics are upgraded and you can play with your friends on your new Xbox rather than having to lug out or find older hardware. Like, to me, that is where, or something like Red Dead Redemption. If you never finished it, they just announced Red Dead 2, which is like 10 years apart. So now, if you're looking forward to Red Dead 2 and you never finished that last one, you don't have to go find old hardware. It's just like watching the original Roseanne before you uh, get into <laughs> the new exactly one. That's exactly what it's like. <laughs> it's literally exactly what it's like, and that's what they were going for. <laughs> All right, so it's a, it's a good story. I got to say, the comments, commentary, the, the comment thread on this story that we had, and maybe I, I this might have the been the old case. one or the no, new the one? No, the new one. Okay. The new one. We're up to 192 comments. Wow. I will I will say, I, this may have been a, more of my headline because uh, <laughs> the headline on this one is three years later, Microsoft's bet on Xbox One backward compatible games is still paying off. So it's no, yes, you can. No. But correct. It, it is correct. still paying off. But no, it, that's, that is, that is a, that's correct. That is a, Potentially controversial declaratory statement, however, which is a, which is a good tactic to take with a headline. I know you're you're better at that than I am. Like, I always <laughs> just like write a factual headline. Well, that's like, that's well, yeah. No, no, but like like it's, I don't have the it's, it's, I don't have the way of thinking of how to make it more alluring. It's it's, it's it's got an angle to it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I like it. All right, hey, that is geared up for this week. Anything else you want to talk about? That's it. That's no, it. No chompers. I've got, I'm putting my AirPods back no in and, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking anymore. All right, good, good. All right, until next time, I'm Todd Bishop. I'm Andrew Edwards. And don't forget to subscribe to Geared Up wherever you get your podcasts. And that's it. Talk to you next time.